The calm before the storm, the silence before the Big Bang, just like the hidden activities that surround the emergence of a buried seed before it sprouts gloriously forth, so was a singular act of historical monarchs, a precursor to the rise of the Dahomean Amazons. The first time the Europeans encountered this all-female combat force, they noted similarities between them and the legendary Amazons of the ancient Anatolia and the Black Sea. As impressive as this comparison was, one can't help but wonder why Dahomey created a female-only military force in the first place. Why not use men? In today's episode, we will be revealing the oral traditions that aim to explain the origins of the fearless Dahomey Amazons. History Style there have been many legends about the origins of the Amazons as people inevitably tell different tales when relying on stories committed to memory. One of the prominent tales stated that the Amazons came about during the reign of King Kwekbeja, the second king of Dahomey. That's who he was. He ruled from the 1640 all the way to 1680. This king had royal authority over the different ethnic groups in his reign and established a well-structured system in the kingdom, including taxing his subjects and serving as the sole judge who presided over criminal sentencing. He was so ferocious a king that he introduced pre-dawn surprise attacks as a war tactic into the Dahomean military system. Some kings were known to be pleased when presented with rare pieces of jewelry or rare clothing. But Wegbeja had a desire for rare exotic beings like elephants amongst other things. A group of brave women who wanted to please their king got together and began hunting elephants for Wegbeja in order to present him with the ivory and the animal's meat for royal feasts. Most claimed that they wore brown petticoats, purple tunics, and black belts, all of which were heavily adorned with magical relics. Their belts were made of hide strips with hair hanging off it around their waist. They also had a leather filibeg kilt with cowrie on the front. Their weapons included broad small arms, they carried their ammunition in pouches made of dark leather, and every member had a hair one tight to her head. Others claim that the battles were dressed in all brown with magnificent carved daggers at their belts and carried long hefty side hams with darkened chambers. Above their forehead, two antelope horns protruded and were fixed on an iron hoop around the head like a diadem. Their hunting techniques revealed their warrior tactics and instincts which were unparalleled. When they were on a hunt, they usually formed a circle and gathered at a spot where the elephant herd was expected to be. While crawling on their hands and knees through the grass and holding onto their side arms, the elephants, fooled by the women's fake horns, would believe they were seeing and hearing a quiet herd of antelopes and continued to be ignorant of the battle's presence. When they got close to the elephants, they would rise all at once from the signal from their chief and fire their side arms. Then, with knives in hand, rush forward to kill the elephants and cut off their tail as a victory trophy. After a successful hunt, the battles would send a messenger amongst them with the freshly cut elephant tail to signify their successful endeavor to the kingdom and the king. At times, the battle could be 20 in number, yet, they would fearlessly attack a herd of about 40 elephants. They often got injured whilst on their hunt, and at times, some lives were lost due to being trampled upon by the wounded animal. For these reasons, some believed that the battles were the foundation of the great female warriors that would eventually become known as the Dahomey Amazons. Come to think of it, it doesn't sound too far-fetched because women who are capable of hunting such formidable beasts for their king would not be scared of going against enemies in a fight for the monarch and their land. 
their courage was unmatched and a manhunt wasn't something they would likely back out of. The other tale that described the origin of these great female warriors centered on the twin children of King Wegbeja. Wegbeja gave birth to twin children named Akaba and his twin sister Ahangwe, otherwise known as Hangwe. After the demise of Wegbeja, Akaba reigned in his stead. Unlike some other African traditions in the pre-colonial era that saw twin children as being taboo, the Daomi Empire belonged to the class of those who saw them as special divine beings. There are reports that some groups, including the Igbo, Ijo, and Ibibio of southern Nigeria, sacrificed twin children as a form of murder punishment. They considered multiple births to be barbaric or evil, and as such, prohibited. Single births was to be the sole norm for humans. However, the majority of the Yoruba in southwestern Nigeria and the Benin of ancient Benin embraced twins as the most prized children, even to the point of adoring them. The Fon people were among those who cherished twins because they believed that twins possessed a unique guardian spirit, retained relationships with the spirit world and had the power to pass away and resurrect at will. Even twins of the opposite sexes had to be regarded equally in the eyes of the Fon. Due to this cultural belief, Ahambe was accepted as a co-ruler with her twin brother Akaba. She had her own palace and court where she acted as she deemed fit. However, tragedy struck in 1708 when Akaba's life was cut short by smallpox whilst he led an expedition against a people living along the Uweme River east of Abomi. Knowing that the news of the king's demise would cause the warriors to lose faith and might even lead to the exploitation by their enemies, Ahambe had to pretend to be her brother on the battlefield. This was made possible because she had a striking resemblance to Akaba and the troops never once suspected that their king was gone until they eventually won that war. Afterward, the question of who would become king arose because Akaba's son was too young to assume the monarch's position. This led to Ahambe acting as the regent until the son of Akaba came of age. Therefore, legend has it that the Akaba Ahangbe twinship probably led to one of Dahomey's most extraordinary institutions, a dualism that existed in many areas of life and possibly gave rise to the Amazons. In that era, it was assumed that all male officials would have a female counterpart who resided in the palace. For the king's benefit, the women's responsibilities included memorization of the men's commitments and tasks, as well as performance reviews and expense tracking. The issue of record keeping in a non-literate society was conveniently resolved by this strategy. Each office a man held was matched with another supporting office for the woman, creating a left-right contrast along the male-female duality. Military Dualism included female officers for male officers, and eventually female warriors for male warriors. These inventions are credited with helping the Dahomean Amazons become established and well-known. Both male and female warriors grew up valuing their culture, monarch, and religious beliefs. The religion practiced in the ancient kingdom of Dahomey was an ancient fun religion that later morphed into what became known as voodoo. Voodoo is a derivation of the Dahomean term for deity, Vodun. Their love for religions was evident in the pre-colonial era when thousands of spiritual creatures known as Vodun were recognized and accepted by the people of Dahomey. These various Voduns can be divided into two categories which included both Voduns connected to the lineage and those brought into the empire by outsiders. The first type of religion was a lineage level religion which was connected to the king's people of Dahomey. These Voduns originated in their land and what brought them into existence was their worship of the spirits of their ancestors. It was even believed that these spirits were able to reincarnate into some families through birth. Therefore, when there was a birth of a malformed baby, the general belief was that it was the ancestor who had come back to life. There were priests 
chosen to commune with these deities and it was mostly a descendant of the lineage who was required to become its worshipper or Vodunsi where one was required. The other type of religion was the worship of Vodun that did not originate from the land of Dahomey. The people of Dahomey were open to deities from other lands that were deemed effective. Such Vodun may already have followers from several nations and ethnic groups and a large number of people from significant geographic and political boundaries may have also recognized it. Much of the popular Vodun in Dahomey was based on imitation gods brought from Yoruba speaking nations to the east such as Gu, the Iron Deity, which we would know as Ogun in the Yoruba land, or Heviso, the Thunder Deity, Legba, the God of Deception, and so on. Any Vodun that was to be accepted, however, had to be tested to see just how effective it was. The people of Dahomey believed that the taste of the pudding is in the eating. A god is believed to deserve prayer and sacrifice if he or she allows a childless woman to conceive or deliver safely, safeguards a man on a perilous voyage, guides a hunter to the biggest game, or heals a sick child. The Dahomeans were constantly looking for gods who had a track record of success. Many immigrants, especially war prisoners, brought their fodun with them to Dahomey and installed them there. Dahomeans were also occasionally dispatched to nearby regions to get training as new god priests. New voduns were also prized as loot when raiding neighboring lands. Apart from the voduns related to the spirits of their ancestors, the Dahomeans also worshipped natural forces as deities. It was believed that special powers were behind nature's forces like rain, wind, etc. These types of deities were non-family related unlike the ancestral spirits. The Dahomean kings were known to have a large number of wives which, if you remember from the last episode, were called Ahosi. However, aside from the wives of the king, princesses were also greatly recognized in the kingdom. The princess or Ahovi also resided in the palace. Ahovi means child king because Aho basically means king and V means child. All people, male or female, whose father was once a prince were referred to as Ahovi. Some female Ahovi could exercise power inside the royal family due to their birth rank. For instance, Ahovi who were elder sisters or the oldest daughters of kings in power occasionally played key roles in the election of kings and their coronation ceremony. The line between an Ahovi and an Ahosi, basically between a princess and a wife, was occasionally unclear in Dahomian society because of the great royal privileges given to the princesses. Kings frequently wed princesses from royal families that were descended from their ancestors. This practice was regarded as cross-cousin marriage and it was mostly preferred among the people of Ewe and Fon of the Dahomey kingdom. It was believed to keep the royal bloodline pure and not tainted. There are records of several princesses not closely related to the ruling king making a big difference in Dahomey's history without residing in the palace. Women, whether Ahovi or commoners, had the best chance of acquiring and wielding power and influence through the palace. Some Ahosi, who were commonly referred to as state officers, exercised great influence inside the monarchy. They were able to achieve this by building power bases inside the palace, striving to serve the king or supporting princes who were aiming to become king. Through these ways, the princesses and other ambitious wives of the king battled for influence. Back to the tales of the Amazons. Ahambe, after the death of her brother, ruled and established an all-female bodyguard squad in 1727. These female bodyguards participated in combat with neighboring kingdoms of Savi. These female warriors were known as our mothers or Mino in the fun language. They were also occasionally referred to as Ahosi. The unit of female bodyguards formed by Ahambe eventually morphed into ceremonial warriors as time progressed and they were so highly regarded by King Gezo who ruled from 1880 to 1858 that he increased their budgets and transformed them from ceremonial warriors into actual military regiments. We will learn more about this 
in upcoming episodes. There's plenty more to learn about the Dahomey Amazons and the Dahomey Kingdoms. Join us in the next episode as we discuss in depth the recruitment process, military training, celibacy, and other interesting historical facts. Dr. Cattell, out.